Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much. Welcome to Build. I'm your host, Ricky Camilleri, and our next guest is an author, uh, an advocate, and of course, an actor. You can see him tonight on the season three premiere of ABC's The Good Doctor, where Hill Harper plays Dr. Marcus Andrews. Let's take a look. Okay. I don't think there's anything else on the agenda, so. Steve was right. And Dr. Glassman is right. You're gonna propose his motion? Dr. Andrews, I don't think you have the votes to carry it. I agree. But I don't need the votes. Just as you have the power to fire someone under your supervision, so do I. You're gonna fire me to save Dr. Murphy. He's not ready to move on. Neither am I. Everybody, please welcome Hill Harper. Hey. Everybody. I was Mr. just looking Harper. at that. That was a nice tie I had on with the pocket square. Ooh, that was, man, our wardrobe lady needs a raise. It looks you, good on look, camera. It's like one of those moments where you see yourself on screen and go, oh, I actually look pretty good. HD, wow. this is a really good screen you guys have. This is good technology up in AOL build. This is, a, you know, my TV, I guess it's a little granulated at home. I don't I didn't see the sharpness of what's happening. It's beautiful. Sharpness, the crispness of that tie. Oh my gosh. Oh. You know, I have to say, there are medical shows and then there are good medical shows. This is a very good medical show. What does it feel like to be on a show like this where the writing is consistent, the arcs are interesting? Yeah. You know, here's uh, everything starts with the writing. And yeah. so, David Shore, um, who created the show House, I don't know if, so you guys are a little young, you probably don't remember the show House, but. But, but House uh, was a brilliant show, extremely well written. So he's the same, you know, executive producer, writer, creator of The Good Doctor. And so the pedigree is there. He knows the world really well. And beyond that, to do a show that's actually about overcoming difference, overcoming obstacles. Um, so it's, it's actually grounded in something that's bigger than the actual story mm -hmm. um, is what's really meaningful. Because on my social, you know, people DM me on Instagram or, or, or tweet me or whatever talking about, you know, I have a son or a cousin or a brother who is, is dealing with autism. Um, we watch the show together and it helps us talk. He'll, he, he or she will say, that's what I was thinking and that's the way I'm feeling. Do you understand? And it's, it's helped people get a, this, this lens in to someone who may think a little differently. Um, but it doesn't mean they think incorrectly. And I think that's the difference maker. I mean, you know, over the summer, it was announced that we're the number one show in the world, right? Wow. And, you know, as far as... Congratulations. Thank you. As far as internationally, and I think the reason why is because obviously issues around autism aren't, you know, it's not just about North America, yeah. it's worldwide. But beyond that, a hospital is like a microcosm of the world. You know, there are hierarchies within the hospital, there are um, political infighting, and then there are regular people that come that just need help. Mm -hmm. And that's where, it's kind of what the world is, right? And so you have all these different people. And the fact that we're also the most diverse show on television um, is, I think, a, a, another reason why a lot of people feel uh, that they see themselves in some way in the show. So um, where do we find Dr. Marcus Andrews going into season three? What's that, happening? That him? scene that, that, that just played ended last season. Exactly. That was the end of the last season. So that decision to keep Sean Murphy, to keep him on, um, was a big decision. One, because there would be no show if Sean Murphy you know, wasn't there. I mean, it's called The Good Doctor, and if he's not there, that's a, that's a problem, right? Um, <laughs> But it's beyond a bunch of doctors, it could be a bunch of doctors that aren't so good. You know, he's no pretty star, good. No star, no star. Um, and people say I'm the bad doctor on the show because I'm kind of the antagonist. But and they were surprised that I took a turn to save him there. So my comeuppance comes here in season three. Your comeuppance, so bad. Yeah, well, it's all relative. It's how you look at it. There's a price that my character has to pay for making that decision that I just made in the boardroom. Right. Um, and he pays a he, he pays a price. I mean, you have to, if you watch tonight, you'll see that he paid a pretty, pretty interesting, hefty price. I'm not, I don't even know if I'm supposed to say that. Well, you know, after... Um, I'm supposed to, I, I, I don't know what I'm, supposed, what I'm allowed to reveal and what I'm not. Is that too much? Did I just say too much? No, I think that's okay. okay. That was a good tease. Did that, that just ruin good. the show? You're like, well, I'm not going to watch it now because he told me what happened. Following, um, following two seasons, you know, where you have a pretty 
a pretty com strong command over your character and what happens. Do the writers, does David Shore, do they talk to you at all about what they're planning on doing or what they're thinking about? Or you get the scripts and you, you, you jump in and go? You, you normally get the scripts and you jump in and, yeah. go, and go. The beautiful thing about great writing, though, is that they're always thinking about how, about character arc, and over time, and, and I, I, I'll tell you, one beauty about doing a show that, that has a foundation of success is that the writers have the luxury of thinking, I think, a little bit longer arc than thinking a show that is, you know, you're just trying to stay on the air that next week. So you're like, I'm going to throw everything into this episode because i got to. And I think that what, they're, what they've done here, which is, I think, really brilliant, is they've created these kind of longer arcs yeah, for agree. all the characters, which is really wonderful. You don't try to do, ram everything into every episode. And, and so certainly my character has evolved a lot, and it's going to continue to evolve because... Um, they because of what happens. You know? The Good Doctor has found, the writers of the show have found very smart ways of being able to maintain a kind of procedural element each episode where there's a case of the week or a couple of cases of the week while at the same time a very smart serialized narrative for, for every character, which is incredibly hard to do as we watch so many shows try to do that right yeah, now. Yeah, and, and I think it's, it even goes deeper than that. If you think about the, the real intelligence of the show, not only do they marry... Um, the the individual cases that come through the hospital door, and you know, and weave those into a storyline with the, these overarching arcs of characters that continue. They also, in really interesting, brilliant ways, without pounding you over the head with it, relate the stories that the people who come through the door are going through with what the characters yep. are going through in their own life. Right, so. You know, I mean, this is a horrible example I'll give, but just as an example, for instance, um, maybe there's a case of a of, of of a couple coming through the door in the hospital that's that's dealing with uh, having a baby and issues, and then another character is dealing with fertility, mm -hmm. right? So there are these links and these 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 things that link the story, and, and that's to me it's called pyramid writing, right. you know, because it, you you write something that if you're really watching the detail. You, you get it, and you get something out of it. But if you're just going to watch the show once, you know, you still have a great experience. So it's like this, it's almost like building a pyramid. And to me, that's great, great, great storytelling, great writing. And, 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 and that's why our show, uh, I think, is, is doing as well as it is. To follow up on the, the pyramid analogy, just because I, I, I think it's fascinating, does, um, does the good Dr. Deshaun sort of, is he at the top of the pyramid and everything, all of the storylines kind of trickle down from him? Is that how it's connected? Is that how you see it? Or is it the base? You know, I... You probably didn't want to think that you are going to have to follow yeah, up on I, this I, analogy. No, 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 no I got it's, it's fine. The, 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 I guess when I think about Sean Murphy, he's the moral core or the moral center of the show. So I guess he would be the base of the pyramid in that sense. Mm -hmm. um, because there's a good, a, a simplicity and a goodness to the character, right? He, he's just, he, you know, there's no pretext. There's no, you know... And what's been interesting is the character is learning how to read people. You know, is it necessary to lie? And because he he doesn't lie, right? Because he doesn't understand the concept of that. It's like, oh, the truth is the truth, and something that's not true is not true, which would be refreshing. Refreshing in this world we live in today, right? Where everyone has a game, or what do I say? What's the right thing to say? How do I play this game correctly? This character doesn't do that. Yet he's surrounded by all these characters that do. And so how does he navigate that? So that's the moral core, the center. So I guess it would be the base. And then you build all these other things around it and, and create more intricate storylines as it goes up the pyramid. Um, forgive me if I'm wrong here, but you are... You're never wrong. Oh, thank you. My show. Thank you. You yeah. are a director now, right? You have recently directed a feature film. Is that true? We're, we're in the process. I'm writing, you're writing, producing, and I'm going to direct this feature called Number Nine. So you haven't started shooting I haven't yet. started shooting. But you're going to. That's going amazing. To shoot. Yeah. You wrote it? It's coming up. Yes, yes. Because right, um, you've written like 15 best-selling books, I've right? Written, I've written four New York Times bestsellers which I'm very proud of, but writing is one of the, thank you, writing is, writing is one of the most difficult, in fact, someone tweeted a question um, to us about, you know, what was the most difficult part of writing my first book, mm -hmm. and um, in the most difficult part of writing my first book is the same thing that was most difficult of the second, the third, the fourth, the, the, it, <laughs> writing. It, writing it itself. It's so painful because it never ends. Because really what writing is, and I, th I think this is what people don't realize who don't write. Writing is just a, 
a constant rewriting mm -hmm. because you're never finished. You can always improve it and always gets better. And that's why I tell people, if you're going to write anything, just bang out that first draft. you got to get that. So many people get paralyzed in finishing the first draft that by the time they finish it, they're so exhausted that they don't even want to continue. And then they're like, this is what I wrote. And it's your first draft is not, is not your thing. Your 47th draft, your 50th, your 60th, that's your draft, right? So writing is, is rewriting, and that's what's so painful about it. But it comes to a point where you have to turn it in, right. and that's the hard part because you know it's not as good as it possibly could be. It's always devolving. It's the same thing with directing a movie. It's not done until they take it away from you and say, no, this has to be done now. Thank right. you. Right. And then you're like, okay, that's the movie that I wanted to make, I guess. So I'm excited. It's about, number nine is about, it's a, it's a, it's a it's a, it's a reference to uh, Mozart's piano sonata number no. nine, mm -hmm. and uh, it it's about a piano player who has lost his flow, lost his genius, lost his juice, so to speak, and he's trying to reclaim it. Mm -hmm. um, and he thinks that Mozart's piano sonata number no. nine is the greatest. See, he believes that Mozart is the greatest composer ever, and therefore, and then he believes his that piano sonata number no. nine is Mozart's greatest work. So therefore, he thinks the greatest piece ever composed is number nine, which just is not true, because anybody who knows anything about Mozart, it, it's probably 21, 22, 23, 24. I don't want to bore you guys. You're like, this movie's going to be boring already. No, I'm, I'm into it. Watch this sounds it. great. Because um, I definitely don't want to treat us on Mozart. But I do. The, 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 <laughs> the whole thing is it's a, it's, it's a cool, hopefully cool, funky indie with a lot of music. I have 12 original songs. Um, I don't know if you guys know this wonderful DJ out of New York, producer named DJ Mel DeBarge. He's fantastic. He's produced my music. Young rapper out of Detroit who I love named Sam Austin. So big shout out to Sam. He's a young cat out of Detroit following in the steps of Big Sean. He's written all the lyrics. Wow. And so it's, I'm not calling it a musical. But I'm calling it more of a music anthology film. But it's a, it's a fun, funky indie that's going to be really, hopefully more people see it than just me and my mom. Uh, two questions. First, had you, had you directed before? Yes, I've directed a short before, and I've directed theater before. Wow. So, but I've never directed a full-length feature. Were, are you nervous going into it, or do you feel like you've had enough experience on set, you know how to kind of at least know how to manage the day-to-day? -day? Yeah, no, no, yeah, I'm not nervous about it. I just want, I just want to make it good. I, and, 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 and a lot of times, you just never know. I mean, you know, it's, it, there's no way to know if something's going to be good. It, that, that's why we're in this wonderful business. It's like you, you're experimenting. You're doing the best you can. But no one's, you know, there's a lot of bad movies out there, for instance, but no one ever says, I'm going to do a bad movie, right? So every movie you've ever seen, even if it's trash, when they started doing it, they really thought they were going to do something. I don't, you know, it, it, they weren't like, we're just going to make a really bad movie right now. Um, so you do your best and, and see how it falls. And where did the... Uh uh, I mean, are you are you personally like a Mozart aficionado or into Mozart, or how did this how did this uh, idea come about? The idea came about um, because the the overarching metaphor for the film is the idea that I believe, and I include myself in this, that most of us get in our own way. We allow fear, which for me stands for false evidence appearing real, all these fears that we've inherited from whether it's our social circles, our family, our community, race-based, gender-based, sexual orientation-based, money-based, whatever, uh, get it, stop us somehow. And we end up in, in some way stuck. And um, the Mozart piece goes back to thinking about this person's genius, but at the same time, um, they were barely, he was barely here. He's very young, you know, when he, when he died. And, 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 but this music that he created was so amazing. And so it's, it's, it's sort of tying new music to old music, right? Because it's the, most of the music in the film is, is, is very contemporary. It's mostly hip hop. But so tying it back to classical and classical roots um, is, is part of what I wanted to do. So just, it's, it's like, to me, I guess it goes back to our pyramid. You know, if we're going to follow that analogy, it's like people who love Mozart and love some of the stuff that, that I'll talk about, that'll be a very small group at the top of the pyramid. But if you don't know anything about Mozart and you don't know any, and you could care less, you'll hopefully still enjoy the movie, right? 
What is your uh, what is your writing routine? Are you a person that wakes up every day and writes? You have to write every day, or do you sort of wait for the idea or the project and then the idea has to come? I can't. I I've, I've tried that. Sit down. I I have some friends. I'm very envious. They cut out time. They're like every day from this time to this time. I'm just gonna sit in front of the computer, dude. That's how they talk. And um, you know, and I'm whatever surfing, whatever comes out, you know. And, and sometimes, man, magic comes out. And sometimes I just stare at a screen. Mm -hmm. I can't do that, you guys. I can't. So I just, I, 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 inspiration hits what I do no matter where I am. What I do is I take my phone or I write myself an email, right. whatever the idea is. And then so, I'll, and I'll subject matter the title of whatever that project is. And then I'll go back and I'll just do a search for all, for all the title of that project. And I'll have all these emails to myself with certain, well, I call them the little kernels or germs of idea. And then... I'll start to try to build each, you know, one out. And, and usually the ones that are good, th they build a, on their own. Right. You know, and they just kind of, a flow happens. But if the flow's not there, I don't try to force it, you know, because it's, you know, you're, you're not getting the, the magic. To me, it's about trying to find that magic, trying to find that special stuff, you know, going a little deeper. Um, and, and so that's, that's what it is. It's just like kind of what you were talking about, the good doctor. It's it's not just a regular medical show, right? It goes deeper in whatever way, and and that's the kind of stuff I want to do. It's like, sure, you could just be some, you know. I mean, there's plenty of other medical shows that have been around for whatever, but that's not what this show is. It yeah. has has a lot of those same elements because you go into a surgery and you deal with emergency cases, and but it goes deeper and deeper, and that's why I think I love the show, and that's what I try to do in my in, in anything I do. Do you, one more question about writing. Uh, do you, when you have the idea, you have the project in mind, I'm gonna sit down, I'm gonna write this, this idea that's, that's flowing. Are you able to do that while you're working on other projects? Like while you're shooting The Good Doctor? Or is it like Good Doctor shooting ends in May or something? I'm gonna have June and July. That's when I'm gonna no, write No, 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 you do it at the same time. See, so I did this show CSI New York for nine years. Yeah. And that's when I wrote my five books. During that time, right? How do you do that? Well, you, you, you're, you're, the thing about sitting around a set, if you've already memorized your lines, which hopefully you do the day before, or sometime before, you're not trying to do it right in the moment. So you do, you've done your homework. Um, you have time. So you're sitting in your dressing room waiting. And it gives you time to write and sketch some stuff out. And then you get inspired and maybe you stay up all night. Now, this has all happened before I was a, a dad, you know. Um, mm -hmm. But now I'm a dad the writing challenge is a little different because my son wakes up very early no matter what time I went to bed. It used to be I could write till four in the morning and, five, you know, I'd be all right. But now it's a little different. So I have to figure, figure it out. And use of time, a little different. Right. Uh, we have a question from Twitter. It's uh, how do you balance life between acting, fatherhood, and entrepreneurship? Any best practices you can share? Best practices I can share, and what they're referring to, we haven't talked about the entrepreneurship side. I own a coffee roastery in Detroit, um, and I have invested in a hotel in New Orleans and uh, a few other businesses. And the, the, I call it sequential focus, right? So whenever you're doing whatever you're doing, that's what you do. So if I'm in, if I'm in my dressing room, I'm not acting, right? I can do something else. When I'm on set, that's it. Like I'm acting. I'm in. I'm in. I'm working. And then when I'm, you know, doing something. So to me, the problem you, I think I at least I can't do it is if I'm trying to act and I'm also trying to return emails, but I'm also trying to write something. I can't do that. I have to do one thing at a time. Now you you can choose your windows of time during the day to do that one thing. It doesn't have to be oh I have to take three weeks and only do this. I think you can you can do sequential mastery within a day. Um, when I'm being a dad, that's all I'm doing. I'm not uh, hanging out with Pierce, and then I'm saying, "Hey, man, hold on, I gotta write." Now, you know, you go on to the, you know, it is a, well, we're, you know. So when it's dad time, it's dad time. Except for right now, because he's in the back, and he's like, "Why'd you bring me here? This is not a playground." <laughs> hey, well, Bill, I don't see what's happening, but he's eating popcorn because you guys have great popcorn here. And he's got some peanuts going on, and so he, he's 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 all right. He's doing all right. Uh, a few questions from the audience. Who's a question? Right here. Hi, sir. Uh, 
Given your academic career and success, I'm wondering how the conversation went with your parents when you told them you were putting your Harvard Law School degree in the draw and going to Hollywood to act. That's a great question. You know, um, so as you rightly point out, I do a job that you don't even need a high school diploma to do, but I have two graduate degrees from Harvard. So the beautiful thing about my folks, my father's passed away now, but at the time, certainly, and, and my mom is still still with us, is that they've always reinforced that I there's nothing I couldn't do. And, 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 and so when I told them that, I think they had um, certainly behind the scenes worrisome discussions, but they never revealed that to me. And that's the one thing I'm always very careful about and, and talk to people about. And even as a, as, as, a, as, a, as a young, you know, as a new father, I don't want to project my fears or my goals onto my child. And, and my parents never did that to me. Um, you know, they didn't say, you know, you should use your degrees first or do this or that. They never projected anything onto me. I think sometimes parents can be the biggest dream killers of all, to be honest, because they project their fears on their child. And I'm more about risk-taking and want, I, I, because, because you never know where a, something's going to lead you anyway. Um, whatever you're passionate about, follow it. If you have an intuition to do something, do it. And that, to me, is the, the magic and the juice. And, and that's why I was very fortunate that they never projected um, those fears on me. They never went negative. Um, they never, I mean, maybe they said something, are you sure this is the thing? You know, do you have a plan? What's the plan? But, you know, I was uh, working, uh, you know, when I finished Harvard Law School, I turned down all these law firm offers, and I took a job as a, as a waiter, working 11 at night to 7 in the morning, slinging burgers and fries. And so I'd be free during the day. I'd sleep from about 8 a.m. to 1, and then I would do auditions and things, and I'd go to acting class at 7 at night and go to acting class from 7 to about 9.30, get some rest, and then go to work at 11 at night. And so that was my schedule. I was this overeducated um, late-night diner waiter. Uh, but it was one of the best jobs I ever had uh, and working with some of the best people I ever worked with. I got the nickname Zapato at that job because I was always standing around and the, and, and the, and the brothers, the, bu the busboy brothers, were like, Zapato, Zapato. He's like, move your feet, man. And, um, you know, but, uh, it, you know, that was something that, that just happens. I, see, I think we teach young people the wrong thing about education. Um, we, we tell them, study this so you can do this, and that's totally wrong. To me, get an education and learn anything that you like or are passionate about so that you have more choices, not less. It's almost like we're projecting onto them that you have less choice. So if I'm not sure I want to be an engineer, why should I get an engineering degree? It's, uh, but if you're interested in engineering, just do it. Don't even be an engineer. But learn engineering. Learn physics. I love physics. Physics are fa it's fascinating to me, but I don't want to be a physicist, right? But I'd love to learn physics. And so if you say, hey, you can take the class or get the degree or whatever, but you don't have to do it, then that's so much more interesting and compelling. And that's what we should be talking to young people about, telling them about education. Not study this so you do this. Study this so you're just a more learned human, so you have more choice. And that's powerful. So I'm sure you're that type of person. Only imagine how the conversation would have gone with my parents. What would they have said? Uh, my mother would have jumped out the window uh. <laughs> to start. Yeah. yeah. No, it, listen, I think that parents oftentimes get their, their own self-esteem out of somehow comparing their child's quote-unquote success to other parents, which is ridiculous to me. I mean, it's, it's, if you just think about how stupid that is, oh, my child is going to this school or that school or whatever, just is your child happy? Are they not addicted to, to, to medications or drugs? Are they staying off the pole? You know, are they out of jail? Are they okay? Are they good? Then they're good, man, and, and let them be, particularly the younger folks. Like, if you're under 21 right now, you're most likely going to live to be at least 150. Right. If you if we look at projections, I mean, people can say some catastrophic things are happening, climate and this, that and the other. All of that is true. But barring some ca catastrophe, you're probably going to live another 125 years. So that means you could do three 40 year jobs. Right. Which used to be someone's full career. Sometimes 20 years was a full career to pension. Right. So you could do five 20 year jobs. It, it, so we have to think about life 
and longevity and passion and what we do in a much different framework, particularly if it's young people. And I've been very mindful of that with my son because he's three and a half years old. He's going to live another 150 years, minimum, minimum. So how do you fill that with joy and love? And, and so I'm not even, I don't even want to rush him through school. If he graduates from whatever at 40, he's still got another 110 years, <laughs> right? He can have four 30-year marriages. <laughs> that's not bad. Because most people say if you get 30 years in a marriage, that's a successful marriage, right? He can have four of them. It's a lot to learn. It's a lie. Yeah. Uh, hey. Next question. Hey, so Hi. you have played other people over the years. So what if there was ever a movie about the life of Hill Harper? Who would you want to play you? I want Barack Obama to play me. <laughs> that would be the best. Yeah. He can make his acting debut okay. as me. I think that would be wonderful. You know, we dye his hair. It'd be really good. I think he would. I think he would do a good job. He would cover that mole with a little makeup. I think. I, I think he'd he'd be outstanding. I think he'd be outstanding, and um, you know, I think it would be a hit. It would be a hit because he's actually really funny too. Yeah. So it'd be good. All right. Thank is, that, you. is that good? You like that? Thank I think. You. Uh, one more. Hi, I was hoping that you'd talk a little bit about the work that you do promoting financial literacy, especially amongst uh, younger people such as myself, and about what about your personal life made you want to talk more about it and to give people knowledge that maybe they wouldn't get in their normal day-to-day. -day. It's a great, great, great question. So, so here's the deal. I started a foundation about 11 years ago called the Manifest Your Destiny Foundation. And I started it, it was the subtitle of my first book. And I, so I took the profits from my first book and I started this nonprofit. And it was about particularly focusing on communities that are under, traditionally underserved and young people in those communities. The number one excuse I, that would come up when I talked about, well, how, well, I always talk about being an active architect of your own life, so I talk about blueprinting. So I think that we all should approach our lives like architects approach building a structure. Most of us walk around with the blueprint in our head, but we would never hire an architect to actually build a building. If he said, I got it up here, right? So I really believe in sketching out your life, your goals, dreams, what you want to build, short-term, long-term, blah, blah, blah. Have a blueprint for your life. So I would do this exercise with these young people, and all the time, money was one of the number one factors that would come up as to why they couldn't do anything. Money was always the number one obstacle. And then I would talk to their parents. The parents would say money was the number one obstacle, access to money, this. And then also, I would talk about freedom and choice, what we just talked about, because I think that's one of the most powerful, valuable things we can have. Again, what's the number one thing? Money. Talk about relationships and couples. Number one thing couples argue about, money. So I was like, well, if money is this big impediment to people actually living the best version, the most free version of their lives, then we got to change our relationship to money. So I took that on. I wrote a book called The Wealth Cure. And it was a horrible title. I got too smart my own good or you know, whatever. I should have called it like super rich or something because people are like, I don't want to buy that book. I don't want my wealth cured. I don't got wealth to cure or whatever. And what I was trying to go for was this idea that we have to change our definition. We have to cure our definition of wealth. But, you know, it wasn't, it, I, I should reissue the book and Still call it. a New York it, Times bestseller. You got right? money. It was a New York Times bestseller, but it would have been bigger. <laughs> it's like, you got money in your pocket. That's what it's called or something like that. Or mad money, super rich. Woo, look at you, you know, something like that. I but, like that one. Woo, look, look at, at you. you. Imagining it written right. out on the cover. With like just... Louis Vuitton LVs all over the, of the, of the cover. That would be, oh my God. Look at you. So all that's to say, it was all about redefining our relationship to money because money to me is energy, okay? Watch where I'm going with this. Money is energy. It's, it's, it's benign, but we have this relationship to it that oftentimes holds us back in so many different ways. And so if we change that relationship and we actually deal with money as this asset, and we basically, I break down this idea between smart money and dumb money. And so what happened is the company Experian, credit, one of the big three credit bureaus, somebody there read the book and they're like, this is what we keep talking about. We're trying to improve people's credit, credit score. And so 
they had this product called Experian Boost, which I thought was very interesting because it was the first time you're able to load in your own financial information about bills you already pay to help improve your FICO 8 score, which is the FICO score that you use for like auto loans. And it's also the FICO score that when they t when, when, when possible employers or folks you're going to try to rent from check your FICO score, that's the score they see, it, which is a different FICO score than for, like, let's say, a mortgage company looks at. Okay, so it's different. People have to under, a lot of, you know, I don't want to get too in the weeds in, in that. But the point is, ultimately, your relationship to money impacts you in so many ways. People who have a subprime credit score below pay over $200,000 dollars over the course of their lifetime in added interest fees because they have a lower FICO 8 score, which just isn't fair, right? Basically, it reinforces that idea that it's, it costs a lot to be poor. It's expensive to be poor, which makes no sense. And so I felt that the way to sort of change people's lives, give them more freedom, give them more confidence, give them the ability to, to, to live better lives would be to improve their financial literacy, change their relationship to money and help. And that particularly hits on young people, not running up debt, not running up student loan debt, uh, apprenticing more. I'm one of the big apprenticeship proponents if we're talking about recommendations. There was a young cat I was working with who said, Hill, I want to go to the Cordon Blue School to be a chef. And this is not knocking the Cordon Blue School, let me be very clear. But I said, well, how much is it going to cost? He said, oh, it's, it's like 35000 a year, two-year program, so 70000 I said, would you have 70000 to, to do? He said, no. I said, well, where are you going to get the money? He said, oh, I was going to do all loans. I said, hold up. You're going you're to take out $70,000 in loans, and then most people who come out of the school anyway have to start on the line anyway, right? So $15 to $20 an hour. It makes no sense. Why not work for fr do a side job? approach the top chefs in New York City and say, you don't even have to pay me. I want to work on your line for free. That's going to be my school, right? You'll end up with zero debt, and you'll probably build more relationships and just same level of experience, right? So you have to look at what someone's getting. Now, if you want to be a doctor, then you got to go to school. I do not recommend <laughs> you just say, I'm going to put up a shingle up on, you know, 179th Street and just come on by. I'm learning as I go. No, 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 no. So there's certain things where you got to do it. There's other jobs where you don't have to, right? So if you can apprentice, apprentice. Uh, and that means work for free, right? Not like, oh, I'm going to try to get this job. It means actually apprentice. Because whoever you approach, give them some value for them to give you value back, right? Yes. That's awesome. I'm the con See, I love you. How old are you? Uh, still 23. You're 23. So you're the future. You're it, man. And I'm so I, I that's why the future is so uh, bright because you like you get it, which is awesome. Very proud of you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. I just want to see um I just want to see that medical show, Medicine 179. Just the, that could be a the show. The doctor that's making it up as he goes as, along. As he goes. That right. sounds fantastic. That's interesting. I don't really know how to do this operation, but Let's give it a shot. Yeah. We got a book out. Hey, and that's, listen, uh, uh, you know, health care costs would go r way down. It'd be amazing. You know, <laughs> As will life expectancy. Life expectancy goes yeah. down, too. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, Hill, man, thanks for stopping by. It's good Thank to see you. you again. The Good Doctor uh, season three premiere is tonight. Tonight. You guys got to watch it. I'm going to tweet live on, on, and then hit me on Instagram. DM me with any questions, ideas. Please, just at Hill Harper. Please watch the show. Please support. If you don't stay up late, if you don't stay up till 10, which a lot of you got to get up early, DVR it, and watch it within the first three days. Because it doesn't count if you don't. Oh, yeah, that's true, right? You got to watch it in the first three days. And even if you don't watch it in the first three just press play when you walk out the door. Because they don't know that you didn't watch it. But you'll know that you're supporting the good doctor. All right? Hill thank Harper, you, guys. Everybody. Let's thank hear you. It. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs>